I can't actually leave. I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna be able to say this. Liverpool five, Arsenal one. Genuinely not a scoreline I could have even predicted, even if I'd done a prediction. I, I I can't I can't actually believe the performance that we've just put in against Arsenal. And I am gonna be I, mean, I am gonna give respect to Arsenal as well. I know a lot of people w- maybe wouldn't. You know, because some people, like you see some of their fans online and stuff, giving it the big one all over social media all week, saying that they were going to smash us and Aubameyang was going to make it, you know, he was going to tear us apart. And honestly, the the complete opposite happened. And we'll go for right from the start. We didn't start out very well. Like, actually, no, we did start out very well and we made a mistake. Andy Robertson got caught out of position and late left open a bit of space for I think it was Maitland Niles is his name. It will be got a good cross in. Maitland Niles followed in, scored the goal, and then it was one nil to Arsenal. And I'm just thinking, well, that was really against the run of play. I I, I did not see that coming. Would not have seen that coming. And straight away, if not I mean five or so minutes later, bang. We click everything back into life. Roberto Firmino scores a goal. And then about two minutes later after that, he scores another goal. And it's 2-1. He gets a no-look finish in there. It's 2-1 to us. And then we just start controlling. We start controlling. You see us moving the ball. The way we move the ball is one of the things that I think has changed a lot over this over this season. From last season, the season before and stuff like that, the way we move the ball is just... It's not just so much better, it's not just more efficient, but it's actually much more beneficial for the team. We don't go into games now playing desperately, like looking for that killer ball that's going to go right through and slice a team in half. Because now we don't try and force it, we don't have to try and force the issue. We play in a very, it's a me- I like to call it a measured, calculated way. We now play in a way that is almost surgical in precision. If you know, if you can keep with what I'm going on this train of thought, we now play in a way that is just essentially we are going to stretch your team and make you create gaps for us. That is how what we're going to do. Obviously, it does help when you've got a defence that, like Arsenal, yeah, it wasn't the best. You know, it's not the best defence that they've ever had. Of course, they would tell you that as well. Back in the day, they used to have one of the best defences in the league. I just can't believe that I'm looking at that. Sorry, I'm looking at the Premier League table. It just flashed up. Not the table, the results for today. Because Tottenham also lost 3-1 at home to Wolves, which is massive. Um, But yeah, back to our game. So we go 2-1 up. And then is it 3-1 for the penalty? I can't actually remember who... Mm, This is really bad, actually. Let me just go and have a look at who actually scored that one. It was, no, sorry, it was Sadio Mane's goal for the third goal. Sadio Mane scored a very, very good goal. Really nice clipped over ball. Can't remember who the, who the ball was over from, um, but it dropped to Salah. Salah drops it to Mane, and Mane just slots it home past, uh, past Leno. That was his name. So I, I've been ill quite over the last couple of days, so I'm a little bit, you know, muddled up in my... Um, in my memory a little bit. So I'm looking at things here, just looking at what we've got. Bloody hell, we've got a plus 40 goal difference now. That's unreal. That is absolutely unreal. And I think to cap off the half, 46 minutes, Mohamed Salah goes down. There's a lot of people online saying that this isn't a penalty. And I I have to disagree. If this was a penalty given against us, man, I would hate it. I really would hate it. But I understand it. I understand it that it is a penalty because of the pressure that's put in the back. Let's go back a little bit to Virgil van Dijk on Hyungmin Son last year at Tot- um, against Tottenham when we gave away a penalty and it made it 2-2, I think it was, at the time. And I just feel that's very, very similar. At the time, I was really angry at that penalty. kind of was a penalty, though. Similar situation right here with Mohamed Salah. And obviously, it comes off the back of him, you know, diving or making the most of uh, a recent challenge in another game that we've just had where we got a penalty. It, it's one of those things, it got given in our favour, but we walk into half-time 4-1 up and I'm looking at this result already thinking, this is unreal. I remember the last time we were 4-1 up against, um, it was just after we'd 
we'd um, the first season, first game of the season, I think we were at home as well. Uh, we were 4 1 up against Arsenal. And I think they scored first in that game as well. And it was just after we'd signed Sadio Mane, and he had a really good game that day. That day Shows how far we've come, really, because that game actually finished 4 3. So we won 4 0 last year as well. We've won 5 1 this year. We come into the second half. And obviously, a lot of people have been turning around and saying, Arsenal, very much second half FC, they're going to come out. But normally, and I've been watching quite a few of Arsenal's games, might surprise quite a few people. I, I've, I've watched quite a lot of opposition games this year when we aren't on TV. You know, like I when I struggle to get a stream or something like that. So I watch opposition games. And watching Arsenal, when they come out as second half FC, was when they were like either 1-1 or they were 2-1 down or something like that. But being 4-1 down would have been one of the most unbelievable comebacks from Arsenal to have come back and actually, you know, either draw or win the game. So what ends up happening is Lovren goes down in the box after I think it was an elbow or an or arm push in the back from Kalasinac or Kalasinac, however you say his name. Again, don't really know if it was a. I can't really judge whether it was a penalty or not. I don't know if it is or you know. I thought it was again. It was quite soft. I think we were lucky to be given it, but it gave Roberto Firmino the chance to get his very first hat trick. For Liverpool, it is absolutely ridiculous that that is the first time that Firmino scored a hat-trick for us. For all the goals and the spectacular goals and spectacular moments that Firmino has had for us, he's never scored a hat-trick, and now he has. Absolutely. And it's now debatable, between, and you guys can debate it as well if you're watching it. You guys can debate who's man of the match. He's obviously up there, Firmino, for man of the match. He definitely could be up there. Guy scores a hat-trick, and he has the game that he did. Unbelievable. But, and I'll talk about Arsenal in just a little, in, in a minute, but Gini Wijnaldum was the player that stood out for me and stood out for me in the last 15, uh, last 13 minutes when he was taken off as well. And the reason he stands out for me when he got taken off was the little, and I mean ever so slight, the little bit of control we lost in the midfield. Not a great deal noticeable, but you notice that our passes and our moves weren't always connecting just as they were for the previous 77 minutes but it was barely noticeable at that point Arsenal had pretty much just gone 77 minutes gone we're 5-1 down we're not going to push the issue on this one you know so but when he got taken off and I thought it was the right call for some of those players well for all the players to go off that did go off it was um, Wijnaldum went off Mane went off for Henderson I think and Robertson went off for Nathaniel Klein. And I thought, it again, it was the right decision to do that. But for me, I, thought, I just feel that for his contribution, Roberto Firmino will get the headlines, and rightfully so for his contribution. But Alden, for me, I put it on Twitter uh, to the Redmen TV, and I said he was the metronome and he was the machine in the midfield. You know, Fabinho had a good game, misplaced a couple of passes here and there, though, but overall had a good game. Uh, Shakiri, I felt, had a really good game. I felt, felt his passing was precise. Um, his movement off the ball was really, really good. But in that midfield, nobody stood out for me like Wijnaldum, purely because everything that he did in every third of the pitch was quality. In our defensive third, in the box, getting tackles in the right place, in dangerous areas in the box where you could risk giving away a penalty or a free kick in a dangerous area... He was very good. Midfield, he was brilliant at getting the ball and moving it forward, playing with other players, getting them in good positions, playing passes between him and Fabinho, playing passes between him and Shakiri, linking that play up to the forward line and moving forward as well. All right, he didn't have an end product, but it's not his job to have an end product in there. Not in our team anyway. I know he does with the Netherlands, but he plays his role brilliantly. And for me, man of the match was Wijnaldum. It was. Not taking anything away from Firmino, because if you could give away two Man of the Matches, I'd give it to both of them, I honestly would, because they contributed equally, like a great amount of things, just in different positions. And I just felt that Wijnaldum was actually really the cog, the machine, the metronome that really helped us keep our shape, keep our discipline and keep our pressure on. That's what I felt won us the game in the end. The midfield battle, we won it massively. Speaking of Arsenal... The two players that stood out for those guys were the guys that combined for their for their goal. Um, I like uh, oh, what's his name? I don't know. I can't remember his first name. Maitland Niles and uh, Alex Iwobi. Those guys stood out. Everybody else 
I felt were a level below. And this is just my opinion. If Arsenal fans do watch this, this is just my opinion. I'm not giving it to you like giving it the big one. Oh, we've just beat you 5-1. I'm not giving it to you like that. I will say exactly how I feel. That I was terrified of Aubameyang before the game. Because I know what he's capable of. We all know what he's capable of. Having seen what he's done in the Bundesliga, having seen his goal ratio in the Premier League since he's come in, he's got magnificent numbers. He's up there with Harry Kane and Mohamed Salah. He is in great company in terms of scoring goals. He was so isolated today. He was so isolated today. You've seen Torreira come in, and he's been a brilliant player for Arsenal. But he just could not do it today. I don't know what it was today. He, he's normally good at breaking up the play. He's got he's got some good pace and a little bit of physicality about him as well. He's, he's normally good at breaking up the play and setting Arsenal on their way. And I felt that the real letdowns for Arsenal today were Lichtsteiner and Granit Xhaka. You just you look at Granit Xhaka sometimes and you just think, you're one moment away from completely losing all of your discipline and you're going to put your team... In a terrible position. He should have actually got a second yellow card. For booting the ball away from a free kick. And he should have actually been sent off. But it didn't affect us in a way where. We can now look at that and say that decided the game. Or anything like that. Licksteiner is a different one. Yeah he can, you know. And I can understand Arsenal fans buzzing. About Licksteiner coming in. But you've got to look at a team like Juventus. Who have a young lad, or I think he's a young lad, young Portuguese lad, Joel Cancelo, take over at right back, which was Lick Steiner's position at Juventus, I believe. I don't believe he played centre back as much as he's played at Arsenal this season, and I think that's purely just down to injuries. But yes, he's a vastly experienced player. He is a very, very experienced player, and he's won loads. But why were Juventus willing to get rid of him? Why were Juventus willing to let him go on a free? And is it because a team of Juventus's calibre were just done with him? They didn't need him. And they let him go on a free. That's the only thing you've got to look at. Is that yes, in general, over the summer, Arsenal recruited well. They recruited in areas that they needed. Socrates is a good centre-back. He's just a bit of an arsehole. But that's fine in football and that's fine for your team. And we've got our own people like that as well. We've got our own people that marshal our defence, marshal our midfield. And people, other opposition fans probably don't like them, but they would want them in their team. And if they were in their team, they'd love them. I don't like Socrates because he can be really, really good, but he's also ageing. Licksteiner, ageing. I think that, I don't know, again, I don't know Arsenal's injury situation but the likes of Bellerin, um, whether he's injured or not, I, I don't know. But they probably missed that. They probably missed having that outlet, that speedy outlet that he offers. Um, I don't know what goes on with Lacazette. Because Lacazette, for me, is the better natural striker than Aubameyang. Aubameyang's got pace. He's got fierce pace. But if you wanted that, you might as well have just gone and got Usain Bolt. Yeah? Because Aubameyang, and it's going to sound absolutely ridiculous, right... Aubameyang isn't the best finisher in the world. He's not. He's not even one of the best strikers in the world. Honestly, he's not. He's not really on that type of list. But what sets Aubameyang apart from everybody else in a striker position? Do a comparison between Bobby Firmino and Aubameyang. Aubameyang would absolutely blister him for pace. He would absolutely tear him apart. And that has done Arsenal and Aubameyang really, really well when it comes to being able to get in behind defences that leave gaps in behind. He's done very well doing that. He really he, That's the reason he gets in front of goal a lot, is because of his fierce pace. But he does not provide, provide the link-up play that Firmino does. Firmino's got the most ridiculous feet. We see that in, on, on display for his second goal. Unbelievable feat. He basically sat down Arsenal's defence and just scored. That was different. And that's, I'm not saying that Arsenal want to be like Liverpool. I'm not saying that any team wants to be like Liverpool. But Lacazette offers you much more as a natural striker than Aubameyang does. And I think the big question for Arsenal fans would be, and maybe even the manager as well, because he is a good manager and they've got good players, they've got good quality players, is you've got two strikers there. 
you got two good strikers that can complement each other on their day, you have to find a way of playing both of them, or one of them is going to be able, one of them is going to be looking to leave. And I think Lacazette could be looking at, at his options, not in January, but in the summer, because if he continues starting on the bench, all right, Aubameyang's their top scorer. But when it comes to playing against like the guys like us coming against you know Man City coming against Chelsea, you are gonna need someone that provides much more to the rest of the team and not just himself. Or Bamiyang, I say it, he was very isolated today because he doesn't offer you anything if it's not in the box. And I know he scored an outside the box one the other day against Brighton, but again they stuck with him throughout that game and they drew that game one one. Like for me, they have to find a way. If I'm looking at this and I had these players, I would be looking to how can I get these two guys in the same team and make it work. That is the most effective thing that I think that they can do. But obviously, I am absolutely buzzing. I really am absolutely buzzing. And I, honestly, I can't wait to go back to bed. I really, I am not well. But I had to come out and talk about this. I really did have to come out and talk about this because this is absolutely a phenomenal result for us. Right now, as it stands, and I know that Man City is still yet to play their game, I think. I haven't, yeah, I've been sleeping a lot. I think they've still got to play their game. So, But right now, we are nine points clear of Tottenham, who are, in fact, just a point above Man City. So, say if, for whatever reason, if Man City don't win, or they draw, or they lose against whoever they're playing tomorrow, we go into the Man City game nine points clear... Even at worst, even at worst, if Man City win tomorrow, I think they play tomorrow, if Man City play tomorrow, then, all right, we go in, you know, we go into our tie against Man City, uh, seven points clear. Unbelievable position and not a position I ever thought I would see Liverpool in, I just not this season. And the fact that we are 20 games in now, 20 games in, plus 40 goal difference, we've conceded eight all season, 20 games in. We're still unbeaten in the league, man. We are still unbeaten in the league. And there are still some people out there that really want to, you know, some Liverpool fans that are just not happy on Twitter. But I'll leave those guys alone for now because I'm too happy. I'm really happy with where we are. I'm so happy with the team. Now we've just got to go and face Man City and do the best that we can. It's all we can do. Anyway, thank you ever so much for watching this video. It's been a long, long video and I spent a lot of time just talking through talking points of the game, but I felt I had a lot to talk about. So, if you've enjoyed it and you've made it this far, thank you ever so much. I hope you have enjoyed it. Do like it and subscribe if you're new around here. Thank you ever so much for sticking with us on this channel. And if I don't make another video, Happy New Year to every single one of you. Thank you once again, and I'll catch you later.